All right, thank you all for joining uh, this session of uh, our seminar series. It's my pleasure to introduce today Sayak. Sayak Paul is a machine learning engineer at Hugging Face, where he helps maintaining the diffuser library. Currently, his day-to-day -day includes contributing impactful feature to this library, training and babysitting diffusion models and reading and documenting them. He has made a lot of contribution also on robustness of transformer and many other projects. And we are very glad to have you here today and thank you for accepting the invitation. Yeah, not a problem. Screen in yours. <laughs> yeah, cool. I'll get started right away. Thanks. Uh, can someone confirm if my voice is audible and my screen is visible? Yes. All right. On my end is good. Thanks. All right. Cool. Yeah, I see multiple thumbs up. Uh, so that's good. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, it's actually. Uh, uh, a privilege for me to be here today, especially amongst folks from uh, IBM, because uh, as, uh, uh, as Yusuf men mentioned, uh, I've also worked on some of the robustness related aspects of transformers. In fact, I worked with uh, Mr. Pinyu Chen uh, from IBM Research, uh, where we uh, teamed together to work on uh, vision transformers, uh, our robust learners, and we ended up publishing that paper at uh, AAAI uh, 2022 and it's it's a it's a work that is very close to my heart uh, so yeah it's indeed uh, an honor for me to be here today uh, but however today I'd like to talk to you uh, about a potentially different and disparate topic uh, it's going to be about diffusion models and how uh, we are bringing state-of-the-art diffusion models uh, uh, to the masses uh, with the library that I help maintain uh, at Hugging Face, uh, it's called Diffusers. Uh, so yeah, and Yusuf introduced me uh, quite wonderfully. Uh, kind of training and babysitting is definitely one of the primary responsibilities of my job. So hopefully I'll be able to shed uh, some more lights. So before before I move on, uh, maybe just to set the context right, I'd like to get a show of hands as to just gauge how many of you are currently working with different aspects of diffusion models just thumbs up uh, would be fine all right cool uh, i see uh, multiple thumbs ups uh, so that's good and just as a disclaimer, uh, this is not my sole work. I'm presenting this on behalf of the current Diffusers team, uh, which of course includes members from the Hugging Face, uh, Hugging Face organization, but also we are a very community driven uh, library. So definitely uh, there will be some stuff that were contributed uh, by the dear community as well. And of course, uh, the work also includes um, the past members of Diffusers team from Hugging Face. And just to sort of introduce briefly uh, my team members, uh, on the left hand side, he is the lead maintainer of Diffusers, Patrick. Then we have William, uh, he is based, around San, uh, based in San Francisco. Then we have EE e. from Hawaii. Then we have Pedro from Spain. Uh, then we have Suraj, who is currently in Paris, but he is uh, originally from India. Then we have Dhruv. Uh, who is currently in India, uh, living out of Bangalore, and I am also from India. So you see, the geography of the team is quite distributed. So that's good. Um, here's here's going to be the rough plan of attack. Uh, I'm going to give you a very very brief intro about generative models, uh, and then I'm going to dive straight into diffusers and how it's uh, helping to enable different. Uh, continuous generation related use cases. I'll, I'll not only cover image generation, but also uh, generation from other continuous modalities such as uh, videos as well. Uh, and then I'll also show you how you can train your uh, custom diffusion models uh, using components uh, from the diffusers library. Uh, and here, here's a very good pictorial overview of different families of generative models when it comes to uh, the visual modality. Of course, it can be extended to other modalities such as audio, but for, for this talk, uh, the focus is going to be heavily uh, on generative image modeling. So there's GAN, there's VAE, then there's flow-based models, and then there's uh, diffusion models. Uh, 
uh, of course, I know that it does not include language models, but I may, as I mentioned, the focus uh, of this talk is going to be majorly uh, on image models. Uh, so yeah, pardon, uh, pardon this mistake, if you will. And today's focus is going to be, of course, about diffusion models. Uh, at this point in time, this point uh, should have been clear. So yeah. And for the next couple slides, uh, we'll concentrate uh, on image diffusion models. Uh, and diffusion, it's a very uh, general framework. It can be applied to any modality, particularly uh, benefiting um, continuous modalities such as audio uh, and, and so on. Uh, but, but for the next couple slides, we'll only focus on image diffusion models. Uh, and here's how I like to think about uh, uh, that one sentence that could be used in order to summarize uh, the whole you know fuss around diffusion models that is to ask what happens when you try to refine a noise vector uh, so that it becomes uh, a realistic image uh, and this is an infographic sort of uh, depicting the idea uh, as you can see we are starting with with a purely random noise and then slowly iteratively uh, we are Sort of refining it so that it becomes uh, an actual realistic image uh, and this is another uh, infographic and you might have guessed it's an iterative process and as you can see we are starting with uh, with random noise uh, drawn from a gaussian and then slowly we are denoising it so that it becomes uh, uh, a realistic image and each at, at each point in time we uh, we sort of run uh, a denoising network uh, so that the, the de denoising takes place because that is that is what uh, we want. And as, as deep learning practitioners and researchers, we love to throw in conditioning wherever we would like. Uh, so when we try to condition this denoising process with let's say some text embeddings computed uh, with a frozen text encoder, uh, we get, you know, surreal creatures like this a photo of a white far monster standing in a purple room now i hope we all can agree that this 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 creatures in reality they cannot exist uh, but diffusion models somehow can make sense out of them uh, and, uh, and and they can understand the input prompts uh, so that they can build some kind of an internal hierarchy of the different contexts uh, you know present uh, in the input text prompt uh, and then they are able to sort of pro produce uh, a photorealistic image that has some kind of adherence and alignment with the input text prompt. So yeah, uh, and diffusion models, uh, the kinds that we are seeing today, for example, the mid-journey ones, DALI-3 ones, stable diffusion XL ones, uh, the kinds that we see today in 2023, well, the path has been uh, quite a long one. Uh, for example, it started with that 2015 paper, uh, where where the authors sort of dem uh, demonstrated the idea of diffusion models, but for only you know simple 2D continuous distributions, it didn't have any mentions of images, text, or any other modalities and so on. It, they sort of ideated uh, the formulation uh, and showed pretty impressive results, but for simple 2D distributions. And then out of nowhere in 2020, we have this paper called Denoising Diffusion Probabilistic Models from Peter Abel's lab. And then following that work, it sort of started taking off. Then we had uh, denoising diffusion Im implicit models. Then we had a banger of a paper from OpenAI diffusion models, beat GANs on image synthesis, and the list just goes on, 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 and on, and on. So it was 2015 when the first diffusion, uh, the application of diffusion the, as a framework for deep learning came up. And then in 2020, after like five years of silence, the community felt like, okay, let's do something with it. And then it, it sort of started taking off. And it, I think it's safe enough to say that GANs are becoming a thing of the past at this point in time. Uh, but we will also see why that might be the case because the amount of controllability, the amount of flexibility uh, that you get uh, with diffusion models that so easily probably might be uh, that factor uh, probably might be the motivating factor here. But of course, GANs are extremely fast. They are way faster than diffusion models. But probably the kind of quality that you are getting with diffusion models, it probably there's a good trade-off. So yeah. Uh, and here are some popular diffusion models for images that you may have already heard of. 
of course i should have corrected and graduated dali 2 to dali 3 uh, because dali 3 is already here then we have stable diffusion the uh, successor of stable diffusion is stable diffusion excel then we have imagine from google then we have deep Floyd, which is sort of image and kind of a model but uh, it was uh, it was done by an organization called deep Floyd. then we have kandinsky then we have roshan all right now now not all, all of these models are open source uh, or open access for example dali 2 or dali 3 is not imagine from google it's not but we do have many open source or open access diffusion models for us to sort of you know build on top of and which brings me to my next point why make them uh, open source or open access in the first place because we want to be able to study study the risk factors and failure cases we want to be able to evaluate uh, the safety measurements and of course we want to be able to build on top of them and potentially improve them now if the giants keep their shoulders private probably these things won't be possible so making them uh, open uh, is definitely uh, helpful for our community uh, in general because it sort of opens many avenues not just research avenues but also it helps enable uh, unravel many uh, cool applications uh, and uh, which could potentially be very impactful uh, across many industries uh, for example entertainment uh, e-commerce uh, and so on and uh, i think now is a good time for me to introduce diffusers uh, and by the way if you have any questions maybe we'll have some time for uh, for a little q a session uh, at the end of my talk but my dms are always open so feel free to reach out at any point in time uh, but in the interest of time let me just uh, continue so now it's a good time for me to uh, uh, introduce the diffusers library well it's a it's an open source python library uh, primarily maintained at hugging face but as i mentioned earlier it's very community driven and we have two objectives we want to be able to provide open and responsible access to state-of-the-art pre-trained diffusion models, but also we want to democratize the ecosystem around diffusion models by making them as easy to use as possible. Now, the second point is very uh, near and dear to my heart, and we will see how we are uh, trying to democratize uh, uh, the ecosystem around diffusion models. All right. Now, let's 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 now discuss some use cases because enough. In enough talk show me the code so yeah uh, so first uh, and probably the most popular use case is to do text to image generation where the system uh, should be able to take uh, a prompt uh, a prompt describing the kind of image uh, you would like to see and the prompt is usually given in pure natural language uh, text description and let's see the number of lines of code you need uh, to do that so if you have already used uh, the transformers library from hugging face uh, these apis should probably look very familiar to you especially the from pre-trained part uh, so here i am using the stable diffusion excel uh, model uh, it's as easy as just calling the from pre-trained uh, method on the stable diffusion excel pipeline and then i'm specifying a bunch of other things like the data type that should be used uh, then I'm also doing the device placement so that it runs uh, on the available GPU and then I'm using the prompt uh, so that uh, then I'm using the pipeline object and calling it uh, on the prompt so that it generates me uh, the image I'm looking for. So you, you can see the APIs should feel intuitive but it, it should also feel very simplistic and natural uh, in nature because certain concepts like device uh, placements if you are already familiar with PyTorch, they should look exactly the same. The Torch D type part, these things should look exactly the same. So we try to, you know, create, we try to strike a right balance in between being explicit as opposed to being simple. In, in PyTorch also, you have to do the device placement yourself. You have to do the uh, type casting part yourself. And we try to follow the similar philosophy here. Uh, so yeah. Uh, and then if you want to strive for photorealism because that's that's absolutely a pertinent aspect uh, for many uh, real world applications so for for you know for hyper photorealism we have got 
other free trend pipelines uh, such as Kandinsky uh, and it's a bit different from how stable diffusion Excel pipeline works uh, specifically it tries to mimic uh, the DALI2 uh, uh, training formulation actually uh, so it makes use of uh, a prior uh, which gives you uh, your image embeddings uh, and then it uses the image embeddings as well as the natural language text prompt in order to create uh, in order to generate uh, the final image so it makes use of two different uh, components uh, to uh, to arrive at the final uh, generation so yeah that sort of uh, support is uh, also there but if you take a look at the code uh, the code should look very simple and at the same time very intuitive so yeah and i wanted to include this slide uh, because in the e-commerce industry for example you probably may have the requirement to you know generate variations of maybe product images and so on so pipelines like image variation uh, is is particularly well suited for those applications and as you can see on the right hand side uh, i was able to generate variations uh, uh, of the input image uh, that uh, that too very uh, easily it's all just a bunch of lines of code and uh, you are done and you might think text to image is cool but how can we extend uh, those things to uh, the, those things to videos because videos are notoriously hard to handle with uh, i'm sure we all all can agree uh, for videos, we not not only have to care about the other time dimension, but also we'll have to ensure the generated frames uh, are spatio-temporally coherent. Because videos, it's not just a collection uh, of different image frames, but also those image frames should be tied together uh, in a meaningful way. And you might think for, you know, arriving at a generated video from a natural language uh, text prompt, uh, might change our APIs, but in reality, that's actually not the case. In fact, in, in fact, the APIs are exactly the same. Uh, like the previous ones, we are still using the uh, from pre-trained uh, from pre, uh, from pre-trained method, and then we are calling our pipeline on a natural language prompt, and then we are basically exporting the generated frames uh, to a video. And here, I'm trying to make Darth Vader surf a wave. So yeah. And then you probably would want to also, you know, uh, condition the generation process, not only uh, just on natural language te text description, but also on other kinds of, uh, you know, conditions. For example, uh, you might want the generated image to adhere to a particular pose image or even a depth map or even a segmentation map along with uh, the natural language text description. So control nets uh, allow us to do that. So control nets are basically uh, auxiliary networks uh, which can compute very rich uh, representations from uh, from uh, from image image space conditionings. Uh, so we'll see how how, how that might look like. Uh, but here, uh, for the purpose of uh, con comprehensiveness, I'm first uh, initializing a control net model which was basically trained uh, to learn rich representations from pose images. And then uh, I'm initializing the stable diffusion control net pipeline. And then I'm trying to make uh, Darth Vader dance as opposed to surf a wave. So this is the basic idea. So uh, on the left hand side, I have my pose conditioning because I want the generated image to sort of adhere to uh, this pose image, but also I want the generated image to adhere to the natural language text description. And when you combine the two, uh, you get something uh, uh, something like uh, li uh, like the image on the uh, right hand side. So yeah, All right. So uh, it's also possible to uh, combine multiple image level conditions. For example, uh, you can uh, you know combine a can edge uh, filter uh, of uh, computed from a particular image and also pose and sort of pipe pipe all of it together uh, using your natural language test description and you get something like this so yeah as you can see the final generated image it adheres to the pose it also adheres to the canny can edge filterings but also it tries to adhere to the natural language test description which is kind of cool and if you wanted to 
make Darth Vader dance actually in a video, you can actually do that. So let's say you have this pose uh, conditioning, but in the video format. And yeah, we now have a better version of Darth, Darth, Darth Vader dancing in a desert. And one particular goodness about this uh, pipeline is, is, is that it allows you to extend any text to 2D pipeline to become text to video one. So that means the earlier pipeline that we saw for text to video, it actually requires uh, pre-training on text video pairs. Uh, but the text to video zero pipeline, it does not require any pre-training uh, by uh, by leveraging, you know, clever ways to sort of uh, compute the cross attention maps so that the generated frames become spatial temporarily coherent. We can actually extend uh, text to, uh, you know, 2D text to image pipelines uh, to become text to video ones. But of course, the downside is that with text with pipelines like text to video uh, zero, uh, it's kind of very difficult. Uh, to generate to, to of course plausible uh, longer sequence videos so the current limit is some somewhere in between 5 seconds to 10 seconds in order to generate videos longer than that uh, text to video zero might fail uh, now we have got a whole coverage uh, for the stable diffusion uh, excel model uh, we have got control nets trained specifically uh, on stable diffusion excel uh, we have got T2I adapters. T2I adapters are kind of very similar to uh, control nets, but they are faster to execute and they are also smaller in size. And then we have uh, in painting. These are all based on the Stable Diffusion uh, Excel model that was uh, released like two months back by Stability AI. And these, all of these models were trained in house uh, by the Diffusers team. So that's pretty exciting. And of course, there might be other checkpoints, but when we uh, sort of release uh, all these checkpoints, I, I don't think the community uh, had this kind of support. So uh, you have got the full cavalry available to you uh, should you want to uh, explore and tinker with these different ideas. Now, of course, being able to generate images uh, from natural language descriptions, it's fun, it's cool, uh, but in many real life use cases, you also want uh, you know models that can generate image but with with a substantial amount of character content let's say you wanted to generate a cool logo for a company uh, now current models uh, the ones that we discussed uh, in this in this talk so far they are not particularly good at uh, generating images with character content uh, so yeah let's see how now if uh, if it was it was trained by the deep floyd uh, group and it's it's actually possible uh, to generate plausible images with character content uh, with this pipeline but it's also a heavy pipeline and that's because it uses uh, a, a better uh, text encoder a stable diffusion stable diffusion excel kandinsky all of those uh, pipelines use um, the clip the, the text tower of uh, the clip model uh, and it's actually contrastively trained, the text tower. So it may not have a rich understanding of how to properly represent text uh, as when compared to other like dedicated text encoders such as uh, T5. Uh, so yeah, if leverages uh, a po more powerful text encoder, which is T5, and it kind of follows uh, the image and training procedure, which is a multi-stage uh, training procedure. And by leveraging, uh, a more uh, a more powerful text encoder such as T5 and by operating on the pixel space uh, if is able to uh, generate images that can contain uh, you know coherent uh, text uh, um, character character content now one particular distinction uh, here to note is if is a pixel space model unlike stable diffusion or stable diffusion excel which are latent space diffusion models so yeah and text to 3D uh, for you know asset uh, and other content creators, text to 3D might uh, might be appealing. Uh, so uh, what we do is we first uh, predict the implicit function, uh, which uh, you can then pipe to your favorite renderers uh, such as NERF, uh, and then you can get you know 3D assets uh, such as this ones. And again, I would like to emphasize on the API side of things uh, for even for generating 3D content, the APIs are not that difficult to read. 
so it's it, in some in, in some ways they are exactly the same uh, as uh, text to video or text to image ones uh, so yeah so hopefully that kind of uh, uh, that kind of proves the point that we want to truly democratize uh, the literature around uh, diffusion models so that by by you know giving you tools that are easy to use that feel intuitive that feel natural and i also wanted to take this opportunity to clear uh, some some of the design design choices uh, in the diffusers library uh, so we we actually prefer uh, our library to become more usable rather than more performant we prefer being simple over easy and we also want our library with a deep focus on customizability over abstraction so if you if you ever had the chance to read through any of our library code base if you have if you had like questions why this code block is written in that way probably you know referring to our design philosophy uh, might help uh, clarify that doubt because as as mentioned here we 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 have a focus on usability over performance so if you feel like this code could have been written in a more performant way probably there is a good reason why we didn't do it because we wanted it uh, wanted it wanted it to be more readable and more usable yeah and there are numerous pre-trained pipelines and models for you to sort of experiment and choose from there's stable diffusion there's Russian there's audio even even pipelines for audios we so we are not just focused uh, on images but we have audio pipelines as well then we have video pipeline uh, which is which is the zero scope model from alibaba and we have all these different pipelines for you to sort of explore uh, and tinker with and we have got support for numerous schedulers and i i, I think i should clarify here is that uh, any state of the art treatment diffusion model it's not actually about a single model you you usually have multiple components you have the text encoder component you have the unit component then you have the scheduler component uh, and for latent space diffusion models you also have a vae component the variational auto encoder component so we have got support for numerous schedulers as well uh, which are interchangeable uh, so let's say you have the stable diffusion pipeline which comes with the default PNDM uh, scheduler. Now, if you wanted to swap the scheduler with a more recent one, such as UniPC, it's absolutely possible to do that. And we'll see how. So this is this gives you an idea of how easy it is to swap different components of a pipeline. And remember the stable diffusion, uh, it's a latent space, uh, latent space diffusion model. It has unit, it has a text encoder, it has a variation auto encoder, and then it has got a scheduler. Uh, so at, if you wanted to swap or swap the default scheduler with a, with a more uh, recent one, it's as simple as specifying the scheduler component, and that's about it. So yeah, and if you wanted to do the same for the unit, maybe you have fine tuned the unit component on your uh, custom data set. It's again as easy as just specifying the unit component. And with uh, this is uh, this is a unit that I fine tuned, and I, I fine tuned on you know cool Pokemon creatures, and here I'm trying to sort of generate a cute rendition of Sundar Pichai, uh, and this is how it looks like. Yeah. And you, as mentioned uh, earlier in this talk, it's possible to train custom diffusion models using diffusers. It's not just a library for performing inference you can actually treat it as a modular toolbox that allows you to train custom diffusion models and we have got a bunch of reference scripts for you to sort of play around with and extend and build on top of them so all of these are quite seminal ones and very popular in the diffusion community all right let's now see how we can train uh, I'll discuss two use cases uh, of training using the diffusers library. Uh, first, let's see how we can train for unconditional generation. The use cases that we saw, uh, it, they are all conditional use cases because you are conditioning the generation process either with natural language text prompt or with natural language text prompt uh, and some image level uh, condition. So, but for, for the timing, we'll focus on unconditional generation. We'll start with a random noise 
and we won't be conditioning the generation process with anything else. So our data set includes cool looking butterflies and we want to be able to generate uh, new new butterflies uh, following matching and following uh, this distribution. So the 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 dotted part that's what we want to learn uh, that the uh, that the reverse diffusion process. So yeah, uh, let's now see uh, how we can do it. So these are all the components that we need. Uh, of course, we need to add noise to our uh, clean images uh, following a particular noise schedule. And we will use uh, the DDPM scheduler uh, for this purpose. We will also sample some random noise uh, from a Gaussian. And then we will also sample a particular time step. And then uh, we will add the noise according to a particular noise schedule using the noise and the time step. Uh, and we will add that noise to uh, a clean image. And on the right hand side, we can see how the image typically looks like after uh, the random noise is being added to it. And we of course need, uh, uh, need a model uh, to predict the amount of noise that was added uh, to the image. So here uh, in, the, in the dotted part, we are basically trying to learn uh, a network uh, which, which can predict uh, the amount of noise that was uh, added uh, to a less noisier uh, image. That's what we are basically trying to learn. So we will use the diffusion uh, community actually uh, relies on a unit a pure convolutional with some transformer blocks thrown uh, thrown in there it but but it's not a pure transformers architecture so diffusion the diffusion community still relies uh, uh, on a on a convolution honed architecture uh, to learn uh, the amount of noise that was added and the unit architecture is uh, is typically followed here now we provide classes uh, for all the standard uh, unit implementations that are out there so since we are dealing with 2D data, image is 2D, uh, uh, we are instantiating a unit 2D model. And this is the, uh, on the right hand side, you can see a rough depiction of, uh, of the unit architectural details. And this is basically all you need in order to uh, train uh, an unconditional uh, diffusion model. So we have our data loader. We are iterating th through the data loader. We are sampling some random noise from a Gaussian and then we are also sampling time steps and then using the noise scheduler, we are adding noise to our clean images and then we are using our unit model to predict the amount of noise uh, that was added and then we are taking the MAC loss and then we are backpropagating the gradients through the model. And uh, if you are familiar with Python, you would agree that this is not some pseudo code, this is actual Python code which uh, you can run in maybe a collab notebook. So yeah, that's the minimal training loop uh, if you want to train uh, uh, an unconditional uh, diffusion model. So I hope this, this things feel natural, this things feel intuitive and also simple to read. So yeah, and I was able to sort of, you know, chuck this uh, code uh, on a free collab notebook instance for about uh, 10, 20 epochs and I was able to generate uh, new butterflies, but also closely uh, following the initial distribution. And I have also linked uh, the collab notebook in case you uh, you wanted to play around with it. Uh, I, I'll, I'll share my slides with you uh, should it be needed later. So yeah. And now let's try to also see how we can train latent space text condition diffusion models because of course you know generating things in an unconditional way it's fun, but even more fun is to be able to control that generation process with natural language text description because that truly gives us some kind of you know creative power. Uh, so now uh, we will see how we can train a text condition latent space diffusion model using diffusers. So the data set will not be the same of course. Uh, we will ha now have image text pairs and the text will basically be captions describing, uh, describing the images. So here I am taking uh, the Pokemon's data set which we uh, talked about earlier. And then uh, let's also try to understand the differences uh, here because it's different uh, from, the, uh, from the unconditional uh, training paradigm that we saw. And it was also for pixel space uh, diffusion models because 
if you noticed here we are actually directly operating on the pixel space level we are not computing some intermediate representation from the clean images and then operating on top of it uh, we are directly operating on the pixel space of the input images uh, so of course we are different di differing from that uh, paradigm here because we are going to see uh, how to train latent space diffusion models condition uh, on text uh, text prompts so we of course need ways to embed the images because it's a latent space diffusion model then we of course need ways to embed the prompts uh, we can use a frozen text encoder for, for that purpose and we also need the unit to accept both image and text embedding so that it can run the denoising for us and predict the amount of noise that was added right so yeah so let's start as this is a latent space diffusion model we will use uh, a, a pre-trained variational autoencoder uh, to give us the image latency. So instead of directly predict, predicting the latency, we will uh, we will predict the distribution and then we will sample the image level embeddings from that uh, latent distribution. Basically, all the good uh, variational autoencoder stuff. And by doing so, we are also inheriting all the goodness uh, uh, of, of of a variational autoencoder. For example, fidelity diversity and so on now after the latents are computed uh, we are again sort of sampling uh, random noise from a gaussian we are also sampling the time steps and instead of adding noise to to the images directly we are adding noise to the latents that we just computed uh, and of course we need a way to uh, compute the text embeddings uh, the embeddings of the text prompts and we are leveraging a pre-trained text encoder for that purpose and then we are feeding feeding off uh, the noisy latents the time steps as well as the pre-computed text embeddings to our unit and we are then again making it uh, predict the amount of noise that was added and then we are uh, taking the loss and then we are back propagating the gradient so that's all about it though again this is actual python code which you can go ahead and run and after uh, 20 30 epochs of training i was able to generate q renditions of sundar pichai and i have also provided a link uh, link to the full fledged example in case uh, you wanted to take a look all right now some so, uh, now i also wanted to discuss some bits that are highly research focused now for example uh by we are we have been following the epsilon prediction objective where we make the unit uh, predict the amount of noise that was added it's also referred to as the epsilon prediction objective but if you wanted to train with more exotic objectives it's also possible you just need to configure the prediction type and uh, be done with it and there are many more features in our training examples uh, which are very research uh, and uh, and practice friendly uh, like faster convergence with uh, the mean SNR technique, noise perturbation and so on. But we also provide support for qualitative validation uh, because metrics for evaluating text to image models, it's very brittle. So it's much better to rely uh, on qualitative validation, which you would perform in between your training epochs to see if the model is improving over a period of time at all. At all. And all of our training scripts uh, have qualitative validation inbuilt. So yeah, uh, and there are other uh, other like good to have features such as easy uh, mixed precision training. Uh, if you want to leverage uh, a, a more efficient form of attention, that's also possible. If you wanted to do parameter efficient fine tuning uh, by using techniques like LoRa, that's also supported. Now here are some works that build on top of the diffusers library such as tuna video that lets you do uh, diffusion models for videos uh, then there's uh, training diffusion models with reinforcement learning basically rl for for better optimizing the uh, the alignment uh, problem in diffusion models uh, and so on uh, and then there are other inference free uh, optimizations uh, the, that we have made available in the library uh, all of this uh, all of these optimizations you know improve on certain aspects for example attend and excite it helps to prevent the catastrophic uh, neglect problem that's kind of prevalent uh, in the stable diffusion family of models 
uh, and then there's also zero shot image translation which is basically the pix to pix uh, zero technique which allows you to do cycle gain like stuff and all of this all of these pipelines are actually subclassed from the diffusion pipeline uh, and we we force uh, uh, force our contributors and ourselves to do so to have a unified uh, and, and natural API interface throughout our library and that's about it uh, if you if you wanted to take a look at the slides feel free to scan the QR code and the thank you picture was also generated uh, of course I had to generate it uh, it was generated using the deep Floyd if uh, pipeline which we talked about uh, so yeah uh, I think we can take a few questions uh, and if there are no questions, we can call it off. Hey, do awesome, you mind man. if I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, thanks. Uh, so you didn't talk about the distributed training, did you? I did not. Um, what's like, uh, is there support for distributed training of, of diffusers? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And what's like the, the general thing? Like, what would we have to do if we want, if we have a custom diffuser and we want to make sure that it trains uh, distributed using hugging face. Yeah, so all of our training scripts uh, leverage Accelerate, and which makes it really easy to take any training script and uh, sort of run it uh, across, you know, multiple machines, uh, multi-node, multi-device setting, and so on. So you will have to sort of write it uh, following those references, and then uh, it should be it should be done uh, automatically for you. And of course, you will have to sort of take care of other things to uh, to ensure maximal GPU utilization. For example, our training scripts, of course, support distributed training, but they are not optimized to give you efficiency and maximal uh, GPU utilization in the distributed setup because we wanted them to uh, be also readable. Uh, so, of course, to trade that away, we, we had to, you know, arrive at some compromises, but it should be possible to make use of uh, make use of diffusers to do distributed training. Gotcha. Thanks. Great presentation. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Sayak. Any other question to Sayak? So I actually wanted just to ask because you 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 mentioned this. So is there any pipelines already with pre-trained model like for three D molecular simulation, like for a generation of molecules, or it's mostly focused images and text for now? Yeah. So we do have support for images, videos, and audio, uh, as I mentioned during my talk. But for molecule generation, we do not have a lot of good you know pre-trained pipelines. So that's something uh, we currently do not have, and maybe the community will take it forward. But as soon as we do have uh, a really good diffusion pipeline for molecule generation, we'll have it in the library. Yeah. And and I just I have I had another question. Like, if one wants like to to contribute with a new scheduler, yeah, how easy it is to to, to do this? Like, because you mentioned it's it's very modular. So yeah. like, what's your recommendation for like somebody that has a new idea? How can you go ahead and? Uh, yeah. So so what I I would suggest doing is maybe so the these works they also come with open source code bases i would recommend uh, folks to follow their code bases as to see how how they uh, sort of override and consider diffusers as a modular toolbox for example uh, the ddpo paper training diffusion models with reinforcement learning they actually uh, uh, they did override uh, the ddpm scheduler so that it returns the entire trajectories uh, uh, of the of the of the denoising path instead of just a, just a scalar value. So I would either recommend following through the pull request that added a particular component, or you know code bases uh, that come from seminal works like this, and nice. then sort of adjusting things. Cool. Thank you. Any other questions to to Sayak? I think the talk was very clear that no one has a lot of a question. It was really great. Thanks a lot, Sayak, for walking us through this uh, amazing library and amazing work. We, it was really impressive to see all this uh, in, in 50 minutes talk. So this was great. Oh, Thanks a lot. No problem. Thank you.
Hi. Thank you. And for the slides, I tried to go through the QR code. I couldn't, uh, it didn't follow. Maybe I will follow up with you for the PDF. No, I'll, uh, I'll, 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 I'll share it right away in the chat. Okay. Okay, that would be great. Uh, for sure. Um, how do I send messages? Uh, let me send you. Uh, so do you oh, see yeah. there is a, yeah, the message is there. Okay, great. Let me try to see that we have access. Great, yes. All right, I have cool. it. Awesome. Thanks a lot, uh, Sarah. This no was problem. great. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you all for joining. Bye-bye.